plastic surgery, there are some common goals that we have with all of our procedures that are universal. These include that we would like the procedure to be safe, of course. We'd like a natural outcome. We'd like to maintain or restore facial harmony. And we'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that in just a few minutes. With rhinoplasty in particular, which is what I'll be speaking about first, not only do we want to restore <coughs> facial form and have a nice form to the nose, we also want to think about nasal function because the nose does serve an important function for us on a day-to-day -day basis. When I speak about nasal function, I'm primarily referring to the ability to breathe through the nose. This is an important issue in quality of life for patients who cannot. There are two main categories for nasal obstruction that we need to think about as rhinoplasty surgeons when we communicate with our patients. These are the medically treatable causes of nasal obstruction and the structural causes of uh, nasal obstruction, which are generally treated with surgical means. The medically treatable causes of nasal obstruction include allergic nasal disease, vasomotor rhinitis, environmental issues such as uh, smoking or toxins, and these are things that surgery cannot correct, and this is something that's important to evaluate in your patients prior to, uh, prior to treatment, and make sure, we have to make sure that our patients understand this. The structural issues are those which are basically due to problems with the anatomy of the nose. And this is the, the focus of my uh, talk today. These are bony or cartilaginous deformities which result in nasal obstruction. I mentioned earlier facial harmony. What do we mean by that exactly? Well, believe it or not, there are some aesthetic norms which have been established uh, for uh, both facial analysis and for the nose in particular. And while that would uh, be an entire talk in and of itself, I'll just refer to a few of the things which I think are important. First, when one looks at the nose, the eyebrow to the nasal tip should form a nice gentle curve extending down, as shown here in this diagram, from the medial brow down through the nasal dorsum to the nasal tip. On profile view, there are a couple things which are noticeable um, that we may not mentally make a note of, but uh, which are certainly there. First is the shape of the nasal dorsum, shown right here, which in general should not uh, show too much of a, a dorsal hump. Um, and also, the angle between the lip and the uh, base portion of the nose on lateral view, the nasal labial angle, which is referred to as tip rotation. Interestingly, there are actually some uh, gender differences with regards to the, the aesthetic in this regard. First of all, in males, this angle right here generally uh, is 90 to 105 degrees. In females, it tends to be 95 to 115 degrees in terms of the aesthetic norm. Furthermore, the patient's height is inversely related to the amount of rotation that we seek. A taller person might uh, look too upturned if, they're, if they had too much tip rotation. And likewise, a shorter uh, person might look like they are uh, too downturned if they don't have enough. Finally, an important aspect of uh, nasal analysis really doesn't have much to do with the nose itself. It has to do with the position of the chin. Chin position affects the perceived size of the nose. If a chin is underprojected, it may appear that the nose is actually larger than it really is. And if a chin is too large, it may make the nose look smaller. So often, the chin is addressed at the same time as rhinoplasty surgery. And in our preoperative nasal analysis, we have to examine this and make a note of it. What about nasal anatomy? Well, the nose, uh, as I mentioned, has some very important functions. Likewise, its uh, anatomy is much more complicated than we might initially think. It's more than just two nostrils there and a pyramid of tissue there to uh, provide holes for breathing. It's actually a very complicated three-dimensional structure with both external and internal uh, anatomy that we're going to go over. It's a bony cartilaginous framework with the skin uh, uh, draping this, much like the uh, a tent with a scaffolding underneath it. The scaffolding of the nose is actually composed of bone and cartilage. For example, up above we have the nasal bones and the, the frontal process of the maxilla extending up to the frontal bone. Beneath this we have the upper cartilages which are paired but actually fused together and fused to the underlying septum. Beneath this we have the lower cartilages which curve uh, from medial out to lateral into a fibro fatty tissue. This fibro fatty tissue in this lateral portion of the lower cartilage actually forms the contour of the nasal ala or the nostril out laterally. Inside the nose we again have some bony cartilaginous structures to go over. The nasal septum divides the nose into two halves inside the nose. It's composed of both bone and cartilage. There's actually an interesting uh, growth in the bone and cartilage of the septum during adolescence, which uh, is what results often in the uh, 
excessively large appearance or dorsal hump of the nose, uh, which we'll talk about in a little while. Deviations of the nasal septum, either the bony or cartilaginous portion due to congenital causes or due to trauma, can result in nasal obstruction. Also inside the nose, adjacent to the septum, we have the turbinates. There are three turbinates on each side, a superior, middle, and inferior turbinate. They run from anterior to posterior horizontally. These structures do swell. There's a cycle to the, uh, to the turbinates uh, swelling, which lasts about four hours. They can also swell more permanently due to uh, allergic insults or other toxins, which we mentioned earlier. Often, the turbinates need to be addressed if they're enlarged at the time of surgery in order to improve the nasal airway. The relationship between the upper lateral cartilages and the septum also has an effect on the nasal airway. As I mentioned earlier, the upper lateral cartilages, shown here in cross-section, are fused to the septum in the midline. The angle formed between the septum and the upper lateral cartilages uh, is termed the internal nasal valve or is a portion of the internal nasal valve. This is an area of rate limiting flow in the nose as shown here on this slide. When this angle is too small, this area, um, this cross-sectional area is correspondingly smaller and thus patients have difficulty breathing through the nose. This internal nasal valve is affected by the septum in the midline, the upper lateral cartilage and its angle with the septum superiorly, and the inferior turbinate shown here laterally. In the past, as rhinoplasty surgeons, we often uh, didn't take this into account. And when remove, uh, removal of the dorsal hump uh, or cartilage up above here was performed, this often collapsed. This is termed internal nasal valve collapse and results in a sort of pinched looking uh, nasal dorsum and decreased nasal airflow. Often these patients were happy with the appearance of their nose because it was narrower, but they could not breathe, which ultimately became a problem for them. This is an example of a patient with internal nasal valve collapse. This patient underwent a rhinoplasty many years ago by another surgeon and was actually uh, fairly happy with the appearance of the nose. However, she simply could not breathe and wished to have something done about that. Her concern was that she would be able to preserve the appearance of the nose but improve her nasal function. I think it's um, hopefully visible on this slide that she does have some pinching of the mid-nasal vault right here. And on internal nasal uh, exam, she's found to have collapse of her internal nasal valve. Is there anything that can be done about this? Well, a revision rhinoplasty can be performed. And in this case, we simply go in and place cartilage grafts between the upper lateral cartilages and the septum in order to widen this angle of, of the internal nasal valve. Once that's performed, the nasal airway is improved. This is a comparative photograph of the patient uh, um, after surgery. You can see the mid-nasal vault through here is very subtly uh, widened. And one may argue that actually aesthetically it's a little bit more pleasing than the overly pinched look. She didn't really notice a change there. Uh, she was actually very happy with the appearance of her nose. However, she can breathe much better, even with a small change in the internal nasal valve angle. Again, rhinoplasty in the past was primarily a surgery of resecting cartilage and bone. Sometimes over-resection can occur in other areas. In this case, the lower lateral cartilage, pictured here on the left-hand portion of the slide, can be over-resected in order to reduce a boxy or round nasal tip. In this case, collapse of the actual nostril itself can occur, and this is termed external valve collapse. The patient pictured on the right actually underwent a rhinoplasty procedure many years ago um, in a different location. And again, was quite happy with the appearance of the nose, but had some serious problems with nasal function, which very much affected his quality of life. This is an example of external valve collapse, and I think you see that on inhalation, his left nostril collapses. External valve collapse and internal valve collapse are uh, one of the most difficult challenges that we face as rhinoplasty surgeons. What about bony deformities of the nose? 